Section 7 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris. Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter. By Montague Glass. Chapter 5. A Return to Arcady. Part 2. When Morris returned to his place of business that afternoon, he had packed Sam Green off to his store upstate with instructions to return in a week, during which Morris hoped to take the matter up with Abe. As for his hour-long absence from his place of business, Morris had provided himself with a plausible explanation in rebuttal to the quiet, ironical greeting that he knew would await him. His program was a little upset, however, by Abe's inquiry, which was not in the least ironical. "'Loafer! Where you been?' Abe demanded. "'What do you mean, loafer?' Morris cried. "'I mean, while you are fooling away your time, Mo Greaseman comes in here to see us, and naturally he don't find none of us here, so he goes away again. From us he goes straight over to Samet Brothers, and that's the way it goes.' "'But, Abe,' Morris protested, "'I thought you told me he cancels his order this morning "'and buys only from Klinger and Klein.' "'Sure, I know,' Abe said. "'But I suppose he finds out he couldn't find "'all the goods he wants with one concern, "'and now he goes over to Samet Brothers.' "'How do you know he went over to Samet Brothers?' "'Morris asked. "'A question. How do I know it?' Abe exclaimed. "'Ain't he left a memorandum I should ring him up there?' "'Well, why don't you ring him up and find out what he wants?' Morris retorted. "'What do I care what he wants, Morris?' Abe rejoined. "'Whatever he wants, he don't want it now, because them two cutthroats would suck him dry of orders. Once a fella gets into the hands of Samet Brothers, they won't let him go till he bought himself blue in the face.' "'Ring him up, anyhow,' Morris insisted. And the next moment Abe was engaged in a heated altercation with Central. Finally, he heard Leon Samet at the other end of the wire. "'Hello,' he yelled. "'I want to speak with Mr. Greaseman.' "'Never mind what I want to speak to him about. That's my business.' "'I ain't the fresh one. You're the fresh one. "'You asking me something which you ain't got no right to ask me at all. "'You know well enough who it is talking.' After five minutes' further conversation, Leon relinquished his end of the wire to Greaseman and immediately thereafter Abe's voice diminished in harshness till it became fairly flute-like, with friendship and amiability. "'Oh, hello, Mr. Greaseman,' he said. "'Do you want to talk to me?' "'Why, no, Mr. Greaseman. He don't owe us nothing. He paid us this morning. Sure.' "'What did you want to know for?' "'Why should we sell his account, Mr. Greaseman?' He's a little slow, you understand, but he's quite good. That's all right. Goodbye. When he returned to the showroom, his face wore a puzzled expression. Well, Abe, what did he want? Morris asked. Abe shrugged his shoulders. I don't know what he's up to, Morris, Abe said, but he tells me he wants to buy from us Sam Green's account. So I told him Sam pays us this morning, and he rings off. "'Why should Mo Greaseman want to buy from us Sam Green's account?' Morris muttered to himself, and then a wave of recollection came over him. Obviously it was Mo Greaseman who had bought out Sam's competitors, and this caused Sam's bank to shut down on him. Now Mo Greaseman was attempting to buy up Sam's liabilities and close him up, so that there might be no competitor to Mo's new business in Cyprus. At length, the humor of the situation appealed to Morris, and he grinned vacuously at his partner. No, Abe growled. What are you laughing at? Nothing much, Abe, Morris replied. I was only thinking, that's all, Abe. I was thinking to myself, Abe, what a joke it would be, supposing, for instance, Sam's check should come back in G. When Sam Green entered the smoker of the 7.30 train, from Syracuse to Cyprus, the following morning, a well-dressed man of sixty followed him down the aisle and sat down in the same seat with him, 
have a cigar the stranger said much obliged sam replied as he took it if it is just the same to you i would smoke it after dinner sure the stranger rejoined handing him another smoke that one after dinner and smoke this one now sam grinned and after they had lit up he ventured the observation that it was fine weather upper it should be colder he concluded for heavy weights oh are you in the clothing business the stranger asked i got a sort of a store sam replied clothing and cloaks and suits also a dry goods store in cyprus in cyprus sam seatmate cried you don't tell me i'm going down to cyprus too my fall buying is through sam said i'm not selling goods this trip the stranger replied i'm on vacation a vacation sam murmured in cyprus that's a medina for a vacation there are worse places than cyprus my friend said sam's new-found acquaintance and thereat began a conversation that lasted until the train finally drew into cyprus would you mind telling me what is your name please sam asked as they prepared to leave the car certainly the stranger said handing his card to sam kirschner sam exclaimed looking at the card kirschner von unser leute sure max kirschner replied did your father once run a store under the opera house here that's right and after he died the widow sells out to a man by the name of marcus senft the same one max replied why do you ask because i bought out that fellow marcus senft sam replied and they got on my books yet debts which your mother sold to senft for twenty-five cents on the dollar and he sold to me for ten cents i'll bet i know who owes him to max commented you could look him over if you want sam said as they started to walk down the hilly lane from the depot to the main street i will after i've washed up at the hotel hotel sam exclaimed what do you mean hotel we ain't go to no hotel you're coming home with me a fellow of an unser loiter should come to cyprus for a vacation and stay at a hotel an idea he linked his arm in max's and together they walked to sam's store we'll take a look in here first before we go up to the house sam said as he opened the door the next moment sam green was clasped to the ample bosom of leah green who glanced inquiringly at max kirschner mama sam announced this is mr max kirschner which you ought to be like an old friend on account he was born and raised in this here town and his father run this very store max looked around him at the shelves and showcases the same fixtures he muttered absently he's only in town for a couple of days mama sam said hesitatingly so i thought we could easy fix up the spare room ain't it why sure mrs green replied as she shook max's hand warmly is the folks all well mr kirschner max smiled sadly you can judge for yourself mrs green he said because i'm all the folks there are oh sure mrs green hastened to say i remember now you never got married why how do you know that sam asked mrs green nodded her head sideways in sam's direction you don't never hear nothing mr kirschner she said with me the women folks schmoozes all the time and you could take it from me mr kirschner they talk a whole lot more about what happens forty years ago as what happens last week already max nodded as the store door opened and a woman of uncertain age entered good morning miss green the newcomer said her eyes glued on max kirschner i was just passing by on my way to the depot and i remembered that i needed a spool of thread mrs green passed behind the counter to reach the thread case going to syracuse today miss duray she asked casually mrs duray blushed I'm on my way to see my sister's little granddaughter, she explained. She's just recovering from whooping cough. Would that be your sister Libby? Max inquired. Mrs. Duryea started visibly. I don't know as I, she began. That's so, Max continued. Libby moved to Elmira. It must be Carrie. She married Len Peters, didn't she? 
"'Well, of all things!' Mrs. Duryea exclaimed. "'Who in the world told you all that?' "'I just remembered it,' Max said, holding out his hand. "'How's Tom?' Mrs. Duryea took the preferred hand gingerly. "'He's pretty spry,' she said. "'Tell him Max Kirshner was asking for him,' Max replied. "'You ain't Max Kirshner!' Mrs. Duryea cried. "'Just as sure as you're Haiti Watson,' Max said. "'How are all the children, Haiti?' "'All growed up and flew away,' Mrs. Duryea replied. "'What are you doing around here?' Max's eyes twinkled mischievously. "'I'm selling goods for Mr. Green here,' he declared. "'Let's see, Haiti. Forty-two bust, I should say.' He snatched a garment from a rack nearby. "'Here's a coat, Haiti, that would stand you in forty dollars in Syracuse,' he said. "'One of those big dry goods stores there figures on a coat like this. Garment, wholesale, twenty dollars. Running a big store with elevators, electric lights, and all modern improvements, ten dollars. Advertising, five dollars. Profit, five dollars. Total, forty dollars. We figure here. Cost of garment, twenty dollars. Store expenses, fifty cents. Profit, four dollars and fifty cents. Total, twenty-five dollars. Put it on, Haiti, and let's see how you look in the garment. Well, I declare, Mrs. Duryea exclaimed, as she allowed herself to be assisted into the garment, you take my breath away. Max stepped back to survey the effect and if the admiration expressed in his face was simulated, at least the friendliness of his smile was not. Now, Haiti, I want to tell you something, he declared. If anyone would say to me that I went to school with you, I'd think they'd had a bad memory. I'd tell them it was your mother that sat next to me in Miss Johnson's room and not you. Mrs. Duryea fairly beamed as she strutted up and down the store. Well, Max, she said at last, let me bring my friend Miss Williams in this afternoon, and we'll decide on it then. But I thought you were going to Syracuse, Max rejoined. I was, Mrs. Dury said, as she started to leave, but I ain't now. The news of Max Kirshner's return spread through Cyprus like a brush fire, and twenty minutes after Mrs. Duryea had left Sam Green's store, Max was holding a levy behind the old counter. By two o'clock he had greeted over fifty old friends, and at least twenty of them had made purchases in amounts varying from five to thirty dollars. "'As sure as you're standing there, Mr. Kirshner, Sam declared, I sold more goods this morning as in the last two months. Max grinned delightedly. His face was flushed, and he looked at least ten years younger as he patted Sam on the shoulder. Look out for the rush this afternoon, he said. If we only had a better assortment, Green, I think we could keep this up for a week longer, and after that we could do a good steady business. We? Sam exclaimed. Max colored and smiled in an embarrassed fashion. "'Of course, I mean you,' he said. "'Why, of course?' Sam asked, and Mrs. Green nodded vigorously. "'Why not we, Mr. Kirshner?' "'Well, you see, I haven't sold goods at retail for so long,' Max explained, "'that I really don't know how.' Sam turned to Mrs. Green with a quick shrug. "'Was hast du gehört? he cried. You don't know how? If I wouldn't know how to sell goods the way you don't know how, Mr. Kirshner, I would quick build up a good business here. Tell me, Mr. Kirshner, how much longer do you got a vacation? Because I'd like to make you a proposition. You could stay with me here for the rest of your vacation, and I would give you half of the profits over the cost price of every garment you sell. How's that? Very generous, Max said. But you don't know what you're offering me, Green, because the vacation might last for several years. Several years? Sam repeated. You mean you retired from business, Mr. Kirshner? Exactly, Max answered. With a fortune of two diamond rings, a diamond pin, and eight hundred and sixty-five dollars cash. Sam and Mrs. Green stared at him incredulously. In other words, Green, Max concluded, 
I have just been fired out of a job as traveling salesman which I held for twenty years, and I don't see a chance of getting another one. For a moment, Sam and his wife exchanged glances. Mr. Kirshner, Sam said, how much can you get from them diamonds? Fifteen hundred dollars, I guess, Max replied. Then what's the use of talking nonsense, Mr. Kirshner? Sam cried excitedly. Come along with me over to the Farmers National Bank and we'll see Mr. Fuller. If he would renew my accommodation for a thousand dollars, you and me would go as partners together in Fertig. Fuller? Max cried. That ain't Wilbur M. Fuller, is it? That's the one, Sam declared. Then we'll not only get him to renew the accommodation, Sam, but we'll sell him some shirts and neckties as well. He and I clerked together in Van Buskirk and Patterson's. As a sequel to Max's visit to the Farmer's National Bank, Abe and Morris waited in vain for the return of Sam's check. How did you know the check wasn't good, Morris? Abe asked his partner a week later. I ain't said it ain't good, Abe, Morris protested. I only seen Markson, which he worked for Klinger and Klein as a bookkeeper in Hammersmith's today, and he says that Mo Greisman goes round trying to buy up all Sam Green's bills payable. He's got about five hundred dollars worth now already. Sure, I know he did, Abe replied. He got from Kleiman and Ellenbogen Sam's three hundred and fifty dollar debt for two hundred and seventy five cash, and Sam sends him a check for the full amount the day before yesterday. I seen Louis Kleiman yesterday, and he was feeling pretty sore, I bet you. Morris nodded. He had been completely mystified about Sam's affairs since the arrival of a letter from Cyprus addressed to Morris personally, wherein Sam repaid the money advanced for his hotel accommodation and announced that he had abandoned, for the present, his intention of returning to New York. Morris's mystification was hardly abated by the following letter, which arrived on the heels of the conversation above set forth. Samuel Green and Company, Dry Goods and Notions, the K&M Self-Shaped Corset, Cypress, New York, May 1, 1910. Yours truly, Samuel Green and Company. P.S. You should telegraph Farmers National Bank for references if he ain't satisfied to ship without it. Business is good. S. Green. Gents, we enclose your herewith memorandum of order. Kindly ship same within ten days by fast freight and oblige. Morris Perlmutter's relations with Saul Klinger retained their cordiality, despite the rupture between A. Potash and Klinger and Klein. To be sure, Mo Griesman's defection had rankled, but Morris consoled himself with the maxim, business is business, and when he met Saul Klinger in Hammersmith's restaurant during the first week of the spring buying season, he greeted Saul cordially. His friendly advance, however, was met with a decided rebuff. "'What's the matter now, Saul?' Morris asked. Saul nodded his head slowly. "'It's a great world, Morris,' he said. Morris agreed with him. "'There's business enough in it for everybody anyhow, Saul, if that's what you mean,' he replied. "'In lots of places, yes, but in others, no,' Saul said. "'But with some people, Morris, they're like a snake in the grass, which it bites the hand that feeds it. "'What's Mo Klein been doing now?' Morris asked. "'Mo Klein?' Saul cried. "'What do you mean, Mo Klein? "'I ain't talking about Mo Klein at all. "'I'm talking about Max Kirshner, Morris. "'There's a fellow which we give him for twenty years. "'Good wages, Morris, and what do we get for it "'after he leaves us, Morris?' "'Left you?' Morris interrupted. "'Why, I always thought you fired him.' "'Sure we fired him,' Saul continued. A low-life bum which he makes always a hog of himself, why shouldn't we fire him? And then, Morris, when we're talking on Mo Griesman's nephew, Rabiner, what does that sucker Max Kirshner do? He turns around and fixes up with a fellow by the name Sam Green in Cyprus to go as partners together in Sam Green's store up there. And mind you, Morris, Mo Griesman had just bought out Sam Green's competitors, Van Buskirk and Patterson, and Max Kirshner knows all the time that the only reason we took on Mozart Rabiner was on account of his uncle, Mo Griesman. Saul Klinger was so interested in his own narrative that he completely failed to notice its effect on Morris Perlmutter, who sat 
with his jaw dropping lower and lower while great beads of perspiration stood on his forehead yes morris saul continued mo greaseman even comes down himself from syracuse to cyprus to superintend things five thousand dollars fixtures he puts in and forty thousand dollars he pays to them two yokels van buskirk and patterson for the goodwill stock and store building and what happens for a whole month mo sits in that store and not a hundred dollars worth of goods goes out of that place morris and why it seems that sam green and max kirshner does all the business because max kirshner's born and raised in cyprus and knows everybody in the place max was born and raised in cyprus morris gasped that's what i said saul replied that's a knockbar shot for a fellow to be more than what morris nodded and rose wearily to his feet i never could remember the name of that place even at all he said well i guess now i'd be getting back to the store you got my permission saul said as morris started from the restaurant these were destined to be the last words addressed to Morris by Saul Klinger in many a long day, for the moving incidents which awaited Morris's return to his showroom put an end to all friendship between him and Saul. Imprimis, when Morris entered, Mo Griesman was seated in the firm's private office, the center of an animated group of four. "'Hello there, Morris,' Mo shouted. There's a couple of gentlemen here which would like to talk to you. He indicated a ruddy, clean-shaven person of approximately fifty years, who on closer inspection proved to be Max Kirshner, shorn of his white mustache and without the attendant nimbus of his diamond pin. The other individual was even harder to identify, by reason of a neat-fitting business suit of brown and a general air of prosperity but in him morris descried the person of what had once been sam green morris you old rascal max cried when you took me over to the prince clarence hotel that day why didn't you tell me that the man you wanted me to go into business with ran a store in cyprus i couldn't remember the name of the place at all morris admitted abe gazed at him sorrowfully the fact is gentlemen he said my partner ain't got no head at all sam green's face flushed in recollection of the phrase never mind he said fervently he's got anyhow a heart and i've got a stomach max kirshner added irrelevantly at least i've recovered one since i've been eating leah green's good cooking sam and mo greaseman smiled sympathetically well what's the use of wasting time here boys mo said at last let's explain to morris about the new combination me and max and sam green here have agreed to go as partners together in cyprus under the name the cyprus dry goods company in a small town like cyprus competition is next good morris exclaimed i'm glad to hear it is the syracuse store included too a ten per cent interest they got although i'm going to run my syracuse business and these here boys is going to run the cyprus end mo continued and now abe as max has got to pick out a lot of goods for the cypress store and i want to do the same for my syracuse store let's get to work for three hours without cessation they labored over potash and pearl mutter's sample line until garments to an amount in excess of five thousand dollars had been ordered when max kirshner saw the total of mo greaseman's selection for the syracuse store he emitted a low whistle say mo he said ain't you going to give your nephew rabbin or any show at all this season usser is stuck greaseman declared i've done enough of that fellow when i got him three years contract with klinger and klein end of section seven section eight of abe and morris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Chapter 6 A Present for Mr. Geigerman. Part 1. Well, Abe, Morris Perlmutter declared one morning in midwinter, 
you look like you had a pretty lively session last night abe nodded slowly i want to tell you something morris he said solemnly i would do anything at all to hold a customer's trade morris i would go on theater with him i would smear him ten spots when he's got the bid already and i would go bait on hands which even a rotten player like you couldn't lose morris but before i would go sit through such another evening like last night morris felix geigerman should never buy from us again a dollar's worth more goods that's all i gotta say why what's the matter morris asked well in the first place morris to show you what a liar that fella geigerman is he brings out a fiddle which he tells us is three hundred years old yah three hundred years old morris exclaimed skeptically a fiddle three hundred years old would be worth the very least a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars that's what i told him morris abe said i says to him if you would get a fiddle which is worth that much money i would quick sell it and buy something which is anyhow useful like a diamond ring or a scarf pin but geigerman only laughs at me morris he says he don't own the fiddle morris but that somebody loaned it to him even if he would own it he wouldn't take two hundred dollars for it my worries if he owns a fiddle or not abe morris commented sure i know morris but that ain't the point afterward mozart rabiner comes in and if i would be felix geigerman morris and a salesman comes into my house and gets fresh with a piano which the least it stands geigerman is in a hundred dollars for morris i'd kick him into the streets yet what's mozart rabiner doing there abe morris inquired anxiously abe preserved a cheerful demeanor although it was the circumstance of mozart rabiner's prominence at geigerman's musical that had rendered the evening so unbearable well morris he explained you don't suppose that geigerman buys all his goods from us morris elevated his eyebrows gloomily i don't suppose nothing abe he said but once you let a shark like rabiner get in with geigerman Klinger and Klein would give them the privilege to cut our price till they run us right out of there. It's an open market, Morris, Abe said. And anyhow, I'm doing all I can to hit that fellow's business. You would think so if you would have been there last night, Morris. First a lady in one of them two-piece velvet suits. Afterward I see the jacket, a ringer, for our style, 4220, Morris. She gets up on the floor, Morris, and she hollers bloody murder, Morris. I never heard the like since that Italian a girl which we got working for us in White Street catches a finger in the buttonhole machine. Mozart Rabiner plays for her on the piano, Morris. And when she gets through, the way Rabiner jollies her, you would think she would be buying goods for Marshall Field yet. And after that Geigerman takes the fiddle and him and Mo Rabiner gets together by the piano and for three quarters of an hour, Morris, they work away like they was being paid for it. Mo Rabiner gets paid for it, I betcha, Morris agreed. What a noise them fellas make it, Morris, Abe continued. Honestly, I thought my head was busting. When they get finished, the lady which done the hollering asks them, Who the piece is by, Morris, and who do you think Ravenna says? How should I know who he says? Morris retorted angrily. Richard Strauss, Abe replied. Richard Strauss? Morris asked. You mean that fellow Strauss of Clitman Strauss and Blimer, I suppose? It must be the same fellow abe said seemingly everybody in there knows him and besides morris that fellow strauss is another one of the musical fellas too only the other day clipman tells me that fellow spends a fortune going on the opera with customers but i thought clipman's partner was called milton strauss morris said maybe it was milton strauss abe continued milton or to richard i couldn't remember it was one of them up-to-date names anyhow and mind you, Morris, that fellow Rabiner has got the nerve to ask me if I didn't like Strauss. What could I say? If that cutthroat Rabiner thinks he's going to get me to knock a competitor in front of Geigerman, he's mistaken. Sure I like him, I says. Why not? In that case, Mo says, we'll play some more of this. Go as far as you like, I says, and they kept it up till the elevator boy rings the bell and says a lady on the top floor is sick. I don't blame him, Morris. I was pretty sick myself. Morris nodded sympathetically so then morris abe continued geigerman takes the fiddle again and shows it to us morris and he says on the back is a ruby varnish rubies is pretty high now abe morris said 
carat for carat rubies is a whole lot more expensive as diamonds give this mars abe cried but i seen the back of the fiddle mars and if the varnish on it was made from rubies mars i would eat it the fiddle was an ordinary fiddle like any other fiddle only one thing i see mars on the inside is a little piece from paper you understand and printed on it is a name from some italian or another with some figures on it geigerman said it was stuck in there three hundred years ago when the fiddle was made and you ought to see mo rabbin of mars he looks at the fiddle for pretty nearly half an hour he turns it upside down and he blows into it and he takes his finger and wets it and rubs on it and he smells it and got vice what he don't do with it he's a dangerous fella abe mars commented you don't never stop at nothing to sell goods. Well, I wasn't much behind him, Morris, Abe said. When he smells it, I smell it. He wets his finger, I wet my finger. Everything but that sucker does to that fiddle, I did. He couldn't get nothing on me, Morris. If he would offer to eat the fiddle, you understand, I would got just so good an appetite as he got, Morris. And don't you forget it. I ain't going to let go so easy. Might you couldn't help yourself, maybe, Morris commented. You shouldn't worry, Morris, Abe concluded. I sold Felix Geigerman since way before the Spanish War already, and I would sooner expect my own brother, supposing I got one, to turn us down as him. Despite Abe's optimism, however, the order for spring goods that Felix Geigerman bestowed on them a month later fell short of their expectations by over five hundred dollars. Business couldn't be so good with Felix this year, Morris. Abe commented. "'Don't jolly yourself, Abe,' Morris replied. "'It ain't so much that business is bad with Felix as it is better with Klinger and Klein. Them two cutthroats ain't paying Rabin or good money for only playing the piano. He's got to sell goods, too.' "'That's all right, Morris,' Abe said. "'Let him go ahead and spiel piano till he's blue in the face. Sooner or later, Geigerman would find out what stickers them Klinger and Klein garments is, and then Mo Rabiner couldn't sell him no more of them goods, not if he would be a whole orchestra already. The personality of Aaron Shellac was simply thrown away on the garment trade. His lean, scholarly face, surmounted by a shock of weavy brown hair, would have assured his success as a virtuoso and no one knew this better than his brother, Professor Ladislav Chelak, under whose tuition he had struggled through the intricacies of the first and second positions. "'If you would only forget you ain't got a pair of shears in your right hand, Aaron,' the professor said, "'and listen to what I'm telling you. In two years' time you are making more money than all the garment cutters together, and all you gotta do is to play just Halfway good. I suppose you're a millionaire, ain't it? Aaron rejoined. And you can play fiddle like a streak? The professor heaved a great sigh as he passed his hand over his bald head. With your hair, Aaron, he said, I could make fifty thousand a year on concert towers alone, to say nothing of two recitals up on 57th Street. But if a feller only got one arm, Aaron, he would better got a show to be a fiddle virtuoso, as if he would be bald. Thus encouraged, Aaron persevered with his practice for some months, but despite the patient instruction of his brother Louis, the garment cutter's wrist still handicapped him. That's a legato phrase, Louis Shellac cried impatiently one night in mid February. With one bow you gotta play it. Which phrase are you talking about? Aaron asked. The one that goes to ra ri ra ta ra ri ra He sang the two measures in a clear tenor voice, whereat Lewis snatched the violin from his brother's grasp, and seating himself at the piano, he struck the major triad of C natural with force sufficient to wreck the instrument. Sing ah, he commanded. Aaron attacked the high C like a veteran and Professor Ladislaw Chelak leaped from the piano stool with an inarticulate cry. Immediately thereafter, he secured a stranglehold on his brother, and kissed him Budapest fashion on both cheeks. "'Tomorrow night already you will commence lessons with the best teacher money could buy,' he declared. 
Whose money? Aaron Shellac inquired, as he wiped away the marks of his brother's affection. Yours or mine? Me, I ain't got no money. Lewis admitted. Me neither, Aaron said. He was the sole support of his mother and sisters. For Lewis, as chef de orchestra in a Second Avenue restaurant, constantly anticipated his salary over Stuss or Tarek in the rear of his employer's café. How much would it take? he asked Lewis after a silence of several minutes. Lewis shrugged. Who knows? he replied. Fifty dollars or a hundred, perhaps. Aaron nodded, and the next day, when he entered Potash and Perlmutter's place of business, he carried with him his violin and bow in a black leather case. Thus it happened that the strains of Goddard's Berkues saluted Abe as he stepped from the elevator that morning. And without removing his coat, he made straight for the cutting room. Cush! he bellowed. What are we running here anyhow, shellac? A cloak and suit house or a theater? Aaron hastily replaced the instrument in its case. I'm only showing it to Nathan, he mumbled, by way of an explanation. Might he would like to buy it, maybe. If you would sell fiddles, shellac, Abe said, do it outside business hours. That's all I gotta say. He proceeded at once to the showroom, where Morris was peeling off his overcoat. The latter greeted Abe with a sour nod. "'I'm sick and tired of it, Abe,' he declared. "'Everybody's stealing our business.' "'What do you mean, everybody's stealing our business?' Abe asked. "'Last night I'm sitting in the Harlem Winter Garden with Felix Geigerman, and Leon Samet butts in on us and tells Geigerman he's got a cousin, which he could play shallow, and Geigerman says that he should come around to the house next Tuesday and play it with him and Rabiner. Abe shrugged his shoulders. "'Might serve us if he does, Morris,' he said. "'Because while I don't know nothing about this here game, you understand, a good way to lose a customer is to play cards with him.' "'What are you talking nonsense, Abe?' Morris cried. "'Shello ain't cards. A shello's a fiddle which he play it with your knees.' "'For my part, he could play it with his nose, Morris.' Abe declared hotly. You mean to tell me, Morris, that a businessman like Geigerman is going to buy a line of goods like Samet Brothers got it just because Leon Samet's cousin plays a fiddle with his knees? Yeah, his cousin, Morris exclaimed. He's as much got a cousin which he plays a shallow as I got one. He's going to give some greenhorn a couple of dollars to go with him to Geigerman's house and play the fiddle. And the first thing you know, Abe, Geigerman is buying from him a big bill of goods. And all that time, our orders get smaller and smaller till we lose his trade altogether. Abe laughed mirthlessly and bit the end off his after-breakfast cigar. If I would worry myself the way you do, Morris, every time a competitor says hello to a customer of ours, he said as he turned away, I would gone crazy in the head shone long since ago already. Nevertheless, he pondered Leon Samet's move all the morning. And after Morris had gone to lunch, he paced the showroom floor for more than a quarter of an hour, in an effort to formulate some plan on regaining Geigerman's business. His reflections were at length interrupted by a faint scraping from the rear of the store. Once more, Aaron Shellac was entertaining the cutting-room staff with a pianissimo rendition of Goddard's Berkues. But even as Abe tiptoed across the showroom, to crush the performance with an explosive cush, the melody seized. That's a genuine Amante, Aaron said, and you could see for yourself inside. Here is the label. Abe stopped short. The word Amati brought back to him the scene of Felix Geigerman's musical, and his heart thumped unpleasantly as he listened to Aaron's exhibition of salesmanship. Moreover, Aaron continued, here is the scroll, which it is ever so much finer as them other fiddles you could buy, for fifty or to sixty dollars. Look at the varnish on the back, Nathan. Shines like rubies, ain't it? What would I do with a fiddle, Aaron? Nathan Schenkman, the shipping clerk, asked. You ain't saying it all, Aaron said, but you got a little boy, Nathan. He ain't a year old yet, Nathan interrupted. Sure, I know, Shellac went on. But now is the time, Nathan. 
you couldn't begin too early look at kubelik and chrysler and all them fellows when they was eaten from a bottle already the old man gave em a fiddle to play with and today where are they in one constant tower alone nathan them fellows make from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars he paused so that nathan might better apprehend the alluring prospect and i'll let you have it for a hundred and fifty dollars nathan he concluded ten dollars down and two dollars a week till paid no interest nor nothing at this juncture abe burst into the cutting room no shellac he roared what are you trying to do skin a poor fellow like nathan which he got a wife and child to support what do you mean skin him aaron retorted i ain't no crook mr potash that's all right shellac abe went on i heard every word you're saying come inside i want to talk to you aaron's face blanched and he trembled visibly but mr potash he began never mind abe bellowed take that fiddle and all that mischievous you got there and come in here abe led the way to the front of the showroom followed by the crestfallen shellac who deposited fiddle and bow and case on a sample table say looky here shellac abe said in kindly tones what the devil are you trying to sell a schnorrer like that a good fiddle why don't you give me a show the blood surged suddenly to aaron's face you he stammered why mr potash i never knew you was interested in violins sure why not abe replied let me have a look at it first he squinted into the right f hole and he grunted in approval as he spied the label which read as follows nicholas amati cremonensis fetchi abat anno sixteen seventy do you know anything about them old violins aaron asked anxiously abe smiled in a superior way not a whole lot aaron he said but by the time he had finished his examination aaron became convinced that his employer was indeed one of the cognoscenti first abe turned the violin upside down and scrutinized the scroll neck belly and back then he blew into the f holes and wetting his finger he rubbed the varnish for five minutes he pursued the tactics of mozart rabiner and even added one or two fancy touches on his own account until at length he laid down the instrument with a profound sigh always the same thing shellac he said people say it's a genuine and it ain't aaron took up his violin and looked at it through new eyes why it ain't genuine he asked i should tell you why it ain't abe exclaimed if you would know what i knew about them things shellac you wouldn't ask me such a question at all do you doubt my word why should i doubt your word mr potash aaron said in the inside is the paper and that's all i know about it so if you would give me a hundred and fifty dollars mr potash you could keep the fiddle bow case and furtick for some minutes they haggled over the bargain and at length they closed at a hundred and twenty five dollars for which abe gave shellac his personal check and you shouldn't say nothing to mr perlmutter about it abe concluded because i want to make a present of it as a surprise to my partner when abe came downtown the following morning he wore so marked of an air of pleased mystery that morris became irritated let me in on this too abe he said let you in on what morris he asked innocently i don't know what you mean at all you know very well what i mean morris rejoined you ain't coming around here grinning like a barn door for nothing i give you right about that morris abe said i got in a good schlag at leon sammet mo rabiner last night morris i bet you i got from geigerman a repeat order in them two-piece velvet suits seven hundred and fifty dollars and you know how i done it cole reformed him morris suggested ironically that's all right morris abe retorted go ahead and joke if you want to maybe i couldn't play the fiddle with my knees and maybe i don't know nothing about spieling pianos neither you understand but i got a little gumption too morris and don't you forget it he retired to the cutting room with a set expression on his face 
as though to imply that wild horses could not drag from him the secret of Felix Geigerman's renewed patronage. For twenty minutes he remained firm in his resolve not to gratify his partner's curiosity, and then, as Morris continued to whistle cheerfully over the sample rack in the front of the loft, he returned to the showroom. "'Yes, Morris,' he said. "'Some fellas, if they would do what I done with Felix Geigerman, they wouldn't give their partner a minute's peace. For months together, Morris, they would throw it up to him. "'What's the difference, Abe, if a salesman gets orders? How he gets them? Morris rejoined, so long as he ain't padding his expense account. "'What do you mean, padding my expense account?' Abe cried. "'A hundred and twenty-five dollars a fiddle cost me, and that's all I charged up.' "'The fiddle!' Morris exclaimed. "'What fiddle?' "'The fiddle which I gave Geigerman last night,' Abe continued. "'And if you don't believe me, you can ask Shellac.' "'Shellac!' Morris repeated. "'What the devil are you talking about, Abe?' "'Yes, Shellac.' Abe went on. The cutter. He comes round here yesterday with a fiddle, Morris, which he wants to sell it to Nathan Shankman. So I gave him a hundred and twenty-five dollars for it. Went furtick. You gave Shellac a hundred and twenty-five dollars? Morris exploded. Are you crazy or to what? It was a genuine Amati, Abe explained. And so soon as I seen it, Morris, I thought to myself, if them cutthroats could sell Geigerman a big bill of goods just by playing on fiddles, you understand, what sort of an order could I get out of him, supposing I should just give him a fiddle yet? So that's what I done, Morris. And he did, Morris. And I was right, ain't it? Say, looky here, Abe, Morris began slowly. Let me get this thing correct. You're paying Shellac a hundred and twenty-five dollars for a fiddle, which you're giving Geigerman? You got it right, Morris, Abe said. It was a genuine Amati. For a hundred and twenty-five dollars expenses, you're getting an order for seven hundred and fifty dollars, Abe, Morris said relentlessly, and some fellows would throw it up to their partners for months together yet. It was a genuine Amati, Morris, Abe repeated for the third time, and for a genuine Amati, Morris, a hundred and twenty-five dollars is no price at all. Sure, I know, Abe, Morris said bitterly. To you, a hundred and twenty-five dollars is nothing at all. What are we made of money, Abe, ain't it? What do you care, spending a hundred and twenty-five dollars for a fiddle, when for seventy-five dollars on Lenox Avenue, a hundred and sixteenth street, with my own eyes I seen it, I could buy a square piano with a stool and scarf yet, as good as new. If you want to shank the fellow something, why didn't you told me? What for a present is a fiddle, Abe, when for half the money I can give him a piano yet? Abe hung his head in embarrassment. But Morris, he said, it was a genuine Amati. For one brief moment, Morris choked with rage. Genuine hell, he roared, and plunged away to the office. For the remainder of the morning, Abe went about his work in crestfallen silence, although Morris, after subjecting Geigerman's orders to a little cost bookkeeping on the back of an envelope, broke once more into a cheerful whistle. "'Well, Abe,' he said at twelve o'clock, "'what is vorbei is vorbei. "'It ain't no use crying over sour milk, "'so I'm going out to lunch.' "'What do you mean, sour milk, Morris?' Abe retorted. "'The sour milk is all on your side, Morris, "'because I'm telling you it was a genuine Amati.' "'All right, Abe,' Morris said as he rang for the elevator. "'You told me that shown twenty times already. "'I wouldn't give you two dollars "'for all them genuine fellas' fiddles and creation, "'and that's all there is to it.' With this ultimatum, he stepped into the elevator, and five minutes afterward he sat at a table in Hammersmith's restaurant, and beguiled with a dill pickle the interval between the giving and filling of his order. At the table next to him sat an animated group, of which Louis Kleinman was the center. "'Yes, sirree, sir,' Louis declared, in defiance of the law of scandal and libel. Six months I would give the feller at the outside.' Fella couldn't attend to business if he'd set up till all hours of the night playing fiddle with that low-life rabbiner. That ain't all yet, neither. Yesterday he pays for a fiddle three thousand dollars. For a fiddle three thousand dollars? cried one of the group, and the good half of a dill pickle fell from Morris's limp grasp. That's what I said, 
Lewis continued. For three thousand dollars yet, he's buying a fiddle. With my own eyes, I seen it in the paper this morning. And when a fellow puts three thousand dollars into a fiddle, you understand he can kiss himself goodbye with his business. At this juncture, Morris beckoned to the waiter. Say, he said hoarsely, Never mind that roast spring lamb and stuffed tomatoes. Bring me instead a rye bread tongue sandwich and a cup of coffee. After the waiter had gone, Morris settled back in his chair and listened once more to the conversation at the next table. All right, then, I'm a liar, he heard Lewis say. I tell you, I got the paper in my overcoat pocket right now. Lewis rose from his seat, and securing the morning paper from his overcoat, he read aloud the following item. Pays heavily for Amadi violin. Mrs. Helene Caragni, widow of the celebrated violinist Bella Caragni, has sold her husband's favorite Amati at a price said to be over $3,000. The purchaser is Felix Geigerman, who said yesterday that the violin had been in his possession for some time, and that there was no doubt of its authenticity. It was presented to Caragni by the late Prince Ludovic Esterhazy whose collection of Cremona violins, now preserved by his son, is said to be the finest in the world. Mr. Geigerman is the well-known Harlem dry goods merchant. Louis Kleinman folded the paper and laid it on the table. "'That's the way it goes, boys,' he said in heightened tones, for by this time he had caught sight of Morris. "'A new beginner comes to you and give him a little line of credit, you understand?' and pretty soon he's buying more and more goods till he gets to be a big maker like Felix Geigerman. Then either of two things happens to you. Either he begins to think you're too small for him, and he turns around and buys goods from some other sucker, you understand? Or he goes to work and throws away his money left and right on automobiles or to fiddles, and sooner or later he busts up on you. And that's the way it goes. You shouldn't worry yourself, Kleinman, Morris cried, turning around in his chair. Felix Geigerman ain't gonna fail just yet a while. Me worry, Kleinman retorted. For my part, Felix Geigerman could fail tomorrow yet. He don't owe me one cent. No, never would. I ain't looking to sell no goods to fiddlers, Perlmutter. I'm dealing only with merchants. Furthermore, Morris went on, if Felix Geigerman hears that you're making a break like this, that he's gonna fail yet, and all sorts of crooks you're calling him Kleinman, he would sue you in the courts for a hundred thousand dollars yet from a big mouth a fellow could get himself into a whole lot of trouble kleinman scrambled hastily to his feet and seized his hat what are you talking nonsense perlmutter he exclaimed i ain't said nothing of the way about geigerman you're the one what's putting the words into my mouth already do you ever hear anything like it i'm saying geigerman is going to fail an idea i never said nothing of the kind all i'm saying is what is right here in the paper, black and white, and if you don't believe me, you can read it for yourself. He handed the paper to Morris, and as the latter commenced to read over the Geigerman paragraph, Kleinman and his friends slunk hurriedly out of the restaurant. For nearly half an hour, Morris poured over the newspaper. Then he choked down the sandwich and swallowed the coffee, which by this time was cold. End of section 8Section 9 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris. Being Further Adventures of Pottish and Perlmutter. By Montague Glass. Chapter 6. A Present for Mr. Geigerman. Part 2. Admitting I'm only your partner, Morris, Abe began as Morris entered the showroom a few minutes later. Don't I gotta eat, too? And in the second place, Morris, if you gotta make a hog of yourself, do it at dinner time at home. Because when a fellow takes up a whole hour having his lunch, Morris, he naturally stuffs himself so full that he ain't no good for the rest of the day. A lump in Morris's throat, which may or may not have been the tongue sandwich, prevented him from replying but at last he swallowed it and after removing his hat and coat he carefully unfolded the paper don't hurry out to lunch abe he said i could save you money i got something to tell you which it could take away your appetite so you wouldn't even want a cup of coffee 
Abe paused with his hands on the hat rack. What do you mean? he demanded. I mean, I'm eating only a tongue sandwich and a cup of coffee in Hammersmith's just now, Morris went on. And who should I see at the next table but Louis Kleinman of Kleinman and Ellenbogen? That's a dirty low life, that fella, Abe. A cutthroat like him should be making money in business. Honestly, Abe, when I see a decent, respectable fella like that... Say, looky here, Morris, Abe said. Let me go to my lunch, will ya? I'm hungry. Hungry, sock, dear. Morris retorted. A fella makes a god of his stomach. You understand this business is nothing at all. For all you care, Abe, our whole trade could fail on us now so long as you could eat. Everybody says the same thing. The fellas the Do me the favor, Morris, Abe begged. Tell me about it afterward. All I'm eating for my breakfast is one egg, so sure as you're standing there. All right, Abe, I wouldn't keep you no longer, Morris said. If you could got it in your heart to eat when one of your best customers is busting up on you, go ahead. Our best customer, Abe cried. Mandelberger Brothers and Company. Get vag, you fool. Morris exclaimed angrily. Why should a millionaire concern like Mandelberger Brothers and Company got to fail? You talk like a lunatic. Once more, Abe seized his hat. I got enough of your nonsense, Morris, he said, starting for the elevator. Wait, Morris cried, grabbing him by the arm. Did you ship any goods to Felix Geigerman yet? Felix Geigerman, Abe repeated. Is that the fella? Morris nodded, and this time Abe hung up his hat and sat down heavily in the nearest chair. "'Who says he's going to fail?' he asked. "'Everybody says so,' Morris replied. "'Even in the papers they got it.' He handed Kleinman's paper to Abe and indicated the paragraph with a shaking forefinger. "'What does it say he's going to fail?' Abe asked, after he read it over hastily. "'Where does it say it?' Morris cried. Why, if a fella goes to work and pays three thousand dollars for a fiddle, Abe, while he only got a business rated twenty-five to thirty thousand credit fair, ain't it as plain and as a nose on your face he must got to fail? Once more, Abe read over the paragraph, and then the paper fell from his hands to the floor. Why, Morris, he gasped. It says here he's paying three thousand dollars for an Amadi which he had in his possession for some time. That must be the very fiddle which he's playing on with Mo Rabiner. Might, sir, us if it is, or it ain't, Morris commented. What difference does that make to us, Abe? Abe's face was white, and large beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead as he replied. The difference ain't much, Morris, he said slowly. Only a Felix Geigerman pays three thousand for the fiddle, which he already got it, and we are giving him for nothing another fiddle, which is the self-same identical article, Morris. Then we are out three thousand dollars, and that's all the difference it makes to us. For two minutes, Morris regarded his partner with a glassy stare. Do you mean to tell me, Abe, that that there fiddle which you bought it from Shellac is the same identical article that Geigerman pays three thousand dollars for? Abe nodded. You couldn't tell the difference between them, Morris, he declared. Even inside the label's the same, the same name and everything. Morris took off his hat and coat methodically and hung them up on the rack. So, Abe, he commenced, you are giving to a schnorrer like Geigerman a genuine who's this violin which it's worth three thousand dollars? How should I know it's worth three thousand? Abe said. Everybody knows that one of them genuine fellas' violins is worth three thousand dollars, Morris thundered. I'm surprised to hear you should talk that way. Shellac didn't know it, for one, Abe interrupted. Otherwise, why should he sell to us a hundred and twenty-five dollars a fiddle worth three thousand dollars? What should a greenhorn like Shellac know about such things? Morris said. Don't you fool yourself, Morris. If Shellac finds out he's getting a hundred and twenty-five for a fiddle worth three thousand, he's got gumption enough to sue us in the courts yet. Don't you forget it. Why should he sue us, Abe? Morris asked. The bargain is a bargain, ain't it? Sure, I know, Morris, but I told the fellow the fiddle wasn't genuine, you understand, when all the time I knew it was genuine. Might you have mistaken, maybe, Abe? 
morris broke in like the fiddle ain't genuine what do you mean ain't genuine i'm telling you the label was inside and even the lot number's the same the lot number sure the lot number sixteen seventy i think it was and the only thing for us to do morris is we should fix up some scheme to get that fiddle back from geigerman and that's all there is to it well go ahead abe morris said go ahead and see him this afternoon for the third time abe put on his hat first and foremost i would go out and get a bite to eat morris he said what good would it do me to get the fiddle back if i would die from starvation first although the manufacturers of mechanical piano players had never solicited felix geigerman's photograph for half-tone reproductions in the advertising section of anybody's magazine he dressed as though he expected the immediate arrival of the man with the camera that is to say he wore his hair after Mahler, while holman and moritz rosenthal contributed to the pattern of his mustache moreover he assumed a paderewski tuft a rolling collar that exposed the points of his right and left clavicles a windsor tie and to preserve the unity of his characterization a slight nondescript foreign accent despite the circumstance that he was born in newark new jersey all this however was not an idle pose on felix's part he merely applied to a dry goods store the business principles of the successful virtuoso and he had found them so efficacious that personally he sold more garments than any six of his clerks he was no less astute in the buying end of the business for in pitting samet brothers clinger and klein and potash and perlmutter against one another he not only secured better terms of credit but he found that it materially added to the quality of their garments thus had abe but known it his seven hundred and fifty dollar order proceeded not from the gift of the violin but from the circumstance that the velvet suits had sold like hot cakes and when he entered the hundred and twenty-fifth street store that afternoon felix greeted him effusively he wanted that second order badly and if cordiality could accelerate its shipment he was willing to try it with abe ah mon ami he cried come inside my office what good wind blows you here abe scowled all this enthusiasm betokened but one thing the violin was a genuine amati after all he sat down slowly and bit the end off of a large cigar the fact is felix he began for myself i don't care you understand but you know mars perlmutter what a crank that feller is felix and so i'm coming up here to ask you something for a question fire away abe you couldn't faze me none felix replied in the accents of newark new jersey well felix it's like this abe went on if we would be selling goods to j b morgan you understand and morris here he is buying for eight dollars a fur overcoat understand me he right away would want another statement felix nodded nowadays you can't be too cautious he agreed so this morning in the paper abe continued morris reads you're buying for three thousand dollars a fiddle and but abe felix interrupted it was a genuine amati sure i know abe said but yesterday i myself am bringing you a genuine amati and i didn't pay such a figure for it felix looked carefully at abe's stolid face for some gleam of humor and then he broke into a fit of laughter so violent that abe suspected it to be a trifle forced all right felix he grumbled maybe you think this is a joke but just the same i'm telling you i paid for that fiddle only a two hundred dollars felix stopped laughing and wiped his eyes well i'm sorry abe he said seriously a fellow should never look a gift horse in the teeth abe but that fiddle ain't worth a cent more than a hundred at the outside do you mean to say it ain't a genuine amati abe asked angrily well i don't mean to say anything abe felix began but there are amadis and amadis some of them are worth little fortunes and others are very ordinary like 
"'Say, looky here, Felix,' Abe cried. "'Don't fool with me. Either that fiddle is or ain't a genuine Amati, ain't it?' Felix paused. He wanted those velvet suits badly, and it began to look as though there would be a delay in the shipment. "'What is all this leading to, Abe?' he began pleasantly. "'If there's anything troubling you, speak right up, and I'll try to straighten it out.' Abe shifted his cigar in his mouth and made the plunge. "'What's the use of beating bushes around, Felix?' he said. "'Yesterday I'm giving you a fiddle, ain't it? Inside it says a fiddle is a genuine Amati. What? Sean Good, if that fiddle is a genuine Amati, it is worth three thousand dollars, ain't it? Because if it ain't, then you are stuck with the other fiddle which you bought it. And if it's worth three thousand, then we are stuck by giving you the fiddle, ain't it? So that's the way it goes.' Felix nodded. It was a delicate situation, in which his credit and the shipment of the suits seemed to be imperiled. To declare flatly that Abe's gift was a bogus Amati might offend him seriously, while to admit that it was genuine but only worth one hundred dollars was to foster Abe's notion that he, Felix, had wasted three thousand dollars on a similar violin. "'I want to tell you something, Abe.' he began at last. There's nothing to this business of selling goods by making presents, and I for one don't believe in it, so I'll tell you what I'll do. Come up here to the store tomorrow morning, and I'll get the fiddle from my house and give it back to you. Abe's scowl merged immediately into a wide grin. I don't want the fiddle back, Felix, he said, but my partner, you understand? He's the one which is always, say no more, Abe, Felix cried. All I want is you should ship that order and tell your partner, if he's scared I'm spending my money foolishly, he can have a new statement whenever he wants it, and I'll swear to it on a truckload of Bibles. When Abe returned to his place of business that afternoon, he expected to find Morris pacing up and down the showroom floor, the picture of distracted anxiety. Instead, he was humming a cheerful melody, as he piled up two-piece velvet suits. "'Well, Abe,' he said, "'you have went on a fool's errand, ain't it?' "'What do you mean, fool's errand?' Abe demanded. "'Why, I mean I knew all along that fiddle of yours was a fake. And anyhow, Abe, I see Milton Strauss of Clipman Strauss and Blimer. And what do you suppose he told it me, Abe?' Abe shrugged angrily. "'If you must gotta get it off your chest before I tell you what Geigerman told me, Morris he said. Go ahead. Well, I seen Milton Strauss, Abe, Morris went on calmly, and he says to me that he knows for a positive fact that Felix Geigerman could have sold that fiddle of his for $3,500 before he even pays for it yet. Strauss says that Felix is all the time buying up fiddles for a sideline, and if he makes a cent at it, he makes a couple of thousand dollars a year. Furthermore, Abe, he says that if anybody's got a genuine who's this fiddle, he wouldn't let it go for no hundred and twenty-five dollars, and the chances is you're paying a fancy figure for a cheap popular price line of fiddles. Abe hung up his hat so violently that he nearly knocked a hole in the crown. In the first place, Morris, he began, it was your idea I should go up there and get the fiddle back. And in the second place, I'm telling you, with my own eyes, I seen that fiddle, and is the self-same identical article, name, lot number, and everything, which that fella Geigerman refuses $3,500 for. He scowled at his partner in anticipation of a cutting rejoinder. But anyhow, it ain't neither here nor there, he continued, as Morris remained silent. We would quick find out for ourselves where that fiddle really is, because tomorrow morning I'm going around to the store and Geigerman gives me the fiddle back. Morris paused in the folding of a velvet skirt. I wouldn't do that, Abe, if I was you, he said. What's the use of giving presents and taking them back again? You can make a feller an enemy for life that way. Sure, I know, Morris. An enemy for life is one thing, Morris, but thirty-five hundred dollars ain't to be sniffed at either, you understand? "'Schmooze, Abe,' Morris cried. "'The fiddle ain't worth even thirty-five hundred pins.' Following this observation, there ensued a controversy of over an hour's duration, at the end of which 
Morris compromised. Say, listen here to me, Abe, he declared. You say that fiddle is worth it, and I say it ain't. Now, if I'm right, we take the fiddle back. You were acting like a couple of cheap yokels, ain't it? Ah, but if you're right, Abe, then we are out thirty-five hundred dollars. So what's the use of talking, Abe? Only one thing we got to do. We got to find a fella which he could right away tell whether the fiddle is or it is not genuine just by looking at it. You understand? This fella, we got to send up to Geigerman's house to look at the fiddle tonight yet. And if he says the fiddle is Abe, then we would take it back. And if he says the fiddle isn't Abe, then Geigerman would keep the fiddle und fertig. Abe nodded slowly. The idea's all right, Mars, he said. But in the first place, Morris, where could we find such a fella? And in the second place, if we did find him, Morris, what excuse would we give Geigerman for sending him up there in the third place? Morris scratched his head. Well, for that matter, Abe, if we found such a fella, we could send him up there to say that he hears from you that you're giving away such a hooser's fiddle to Geigerman and that the fellow would like to buy it off of him. And then, Morris, Abe asked. And then, Morris went on, Geigerman shows the feller the fiddle, you understand, and if it is worth it, or it isn't worth it, the fellow says nothing to Geigerman, but he comes back and reports to us. Abe nodded again. If I was to tell you all the weak points of that scheme, Morris, he said, I could stand here talking until my tongue dropped out yet, but all I got to say is, Morris, the idea's yours. Go ahead and carry it out. Me, I got nothing to say about it, either one way or the other. At seven that evening, while Professor Ladislav Chelak was washing down a late breakfast with a bottle of beer, there came a violent knocking at the hall door. The professor answered it in person, for Aaron was busily engaged over Conconi's vocalizations in the front parlor, and the other members of the family were washing dishes in the rear. "'New landsman!' Ladislaw cried. Ain't you working tonight? The newcomer was none other than Emil Pilz, concertmeister of the Palace Theatre of Varieties, if that dignified term may be applied to the first violin of an orchestra of twenty. I am and I ain't, Emil replied. I've got a job, Louis, which would take me till nine o'clock, so be a good fella and substitute for me at the theatres till I'm coming back. And who would substitute for me, Emil? the professor asked. "'That's all right,' Emil replied. "'I stopped in on my way over, and I seen old man who by. He ain't shicka yet, so I told him he should go over and fiddle a couple at Sardis till you come, and to tell you the boss he got a magen van would be a little late. Me, I'm going uptown to look at a fiddle. I got the job through an old pupil, Milton Strauss, which he says a fellow by the name Potash gives away a fiddle which he bought, and now he thinks it's a genuine Amati. So I should please go up and look at it, and if it is owed or it isn't, I got ten dollars. Who's this fellow Potash? the professor asked, and Emil shrugged. What difference does it make? he said. He gives me a hundred and twenty-five dollars for the fiddle only a couple of days ago. What do you want to know for? Oh, nothing, the professor replied. Only my brother Aaron sold to a feller by the name Potash the other day a fiddle which I myself bought from old Hubai a couple of years ago for fifteen dollars yet. If that's the one you're talking about, Emil, you should go quick up to the theater and forget about it, because, Emil, if that fiddle is an Amati, you are Cabellic and I'm Chrysler. Sure, I know, Louis, Emil agreed. But just the same, I gotta go up there to make the ten. So if you do me the favor and spiel for me till half past nine, you can get anyhow three dollars of it. I'm willing, the professor said and ten minutes later he was on his way up to the Palace Theatre of Varieties. It was precisely half-past nine, while a tabloid drama in progress on the stage rendered the presence of the orchestra unnecessary that Emil Pilz returned. "'No, Emil,' Louis said, as they stood in the corridor leading to the stage entrance. "'Did you see the Amati?' He grinned in humorous anticipation of Emil's answer. Yes, I did seen it, Emil replied, and it is very elegant, grand model. Sure, the professor said, made in Bavaria with an axe. Don't you fool yourself, Louis, 
emile retorted it's an elegant instrument from nicola Mati's best period if it's worth a cent it's worth three thousand dollars schmooze emile lewis cried what are you trying to do kid me what do you mean kid you emile asked i should never stir from this spot lewis if it ain't in the Mati. it's got a tone like gold lewis for a brief interval lewis stared at his informant do you need to tell me, Emil, that the fiddle is a real genuine Amati? Listen here to me, Louis, Emil declared. If I wouldn't be sure that it was a genuine, why should I go to such a heart that I would act this way to that fellow Potash? When so sure as you're standing there, Louis, when I told him it was a genuine Amati, he pretty near got a fit already. And as for his partner by the name of Perlmutter, he hollered that I thought he was going to spit blood already. Louis licked his dry lips before making any reply. So then I'm paying fifteen dollars for a fiddle, which is a genuine Amati, he said. And that brother of mine, which he ain't got no more sense as a lunatic, lets it go for a song already? Well, I couldn't stop to talk to you now, Louis, Emil said. I must got to get on the job. I'm going to be tomorrow morning, ten o'clock, at here, Potash and Perlmutter's. If you want, you could meet me there with Old Man Hubai. Old Man Hubai? What's he got to do with it? He's got a whole lot to do with it, Louis. Emil said. A fellow like him sells you a $3,000 violin for $15, which he ain't got a penny in the world, you understand, and I should stand by and see him get done? Professor Chellock hung his head and blushed. Also, Lewis, Emil concluded, I just rung him up at the cafe, and he says whatever he gets out of it, I get half. When Morris Perlmutter arrived at Felix Geigerman's store the next morning, he showed the effects of a restless night and no breakfast, for he had found it impossible either to eat or sleep until he had his hands on the violin. Mr. Geigerman went out for a minute, Mr. Potash, a floor walker explained, but he said I should show you right into his office, Mr. Potash. My name ain't Potash, Morris replied. That's my partner, which he couldn't get up here on account he's sick. That's all right the floor walker said reassuringly. Just step this way. He conducted Morris to Geigerman's office. Have a seat, Mr. Perlmutter, he said. But the words fell on deaf ears, for as soon as he entered the room, Morris descried the violin, which rested on top of Geigerman's desk. He pounced on it immediately, and turning it over in his hand, he examined it with the minutest care. At length he discerned the label inside the F-hole. It was curling away from the wood and appeared to be ready to drop off, so that it was an easy matter for Morris to impale it on his scarf-pin. By dint of a little scraping, he managed to draw one edge of it through the F-hole, and the next moment he was examining the faded printing. Then he turned the label over, and in one corner he discovered an oval mark. Simultaneously, the door opened, and Geigerman entered. Morris thrust the label into his pocket and turned to Geigerman with an amiable smile. Moreover, his pallor had given place to a pronounced flush, and he looked nearly five years younger than when he walked into the store just ten minutes before. "'Hello, Felix,' he cried, holding out his hand. How's the boy? Fine, Felix said. Where's Abe? He couldn't get here on account he's sitting up late again last night, and of course Felix, he's sick. But anyhow, Felix, I'm glad he ain't coming. Why so? Felix asked. Because you never seen such a feller in your life, Felix, Morris went on, always worrying and always kicking. First he gives you a fiddle, then he wants to take it back again. With me it's different. What do I care if the fiddle is or ain't one of them genuine who's this? Once you give a thing, you give a thing, ain't it? I don't care what experts say, no nothing. Felix Geigerman blushed. When Emil Piltz had called on him the night before, he had scented the object of the visit and had exhibited not Abe's gift, but the Karanyi Amadi. He had no doubt that Piltz communicated to Potash and Perlmutter the result of his call immediately after its conclusion, and he felt touched and humbled by Morris's generous behavior. Morris, he said, I did you a big injury. I didn't think you felt that way about it. 
so when that expert called on me last night i didn't show him abe's fiddle at all i showed him the other one the three thousand dollar fiddle morris's grin became a trifle broader that don't worry me none felix he declared i'm glad you should keep the fiddle if it should be worth ten thousand dollars even a gift is a gift felix that's very generous of you morris i must say felix replied and i would keep the violin i would even do more morris i was going to give klinger and klein an order for some of the three-piece broadcloths but i changed my mind i will give it to you instead and if you be in this afternoon morris i'll go downtown and pick him out once more morris wrung his customer's hand before proceeding downtown he sought the nearest dairy restaurant and made tremendous inroads upon its stock of eggs and coffee it was almost ten o'clock before he reached his place of business and as he stepped out of the elevator he was greeted by a roar of voices approximating the effect of a well-managed mob scene in a capital and labor drama old man hubai stood in the middle of the showroom and with clenched fists waving in the air he appealed to heaven to witness that he was a poor man and spoke nothing but the hungarian tongue hence he was at the mercy of such ruffians as pilts and chelak whose right name he averred to be cone following this he swore by his mother that he had paid a thousand kronen for the violin and de capo from the exposition of his poverty simultaneously professor ladislaw chelak dwelt on the economic aspect of the matter in stentorian tones he declared abe's purchase of the violin to be another example of capital sitting upon the neck of labor and he prophesied the rapid approach of the social revolution with sundry references to bloodsuckers cutthroats and philistines emile piltz aaron and abe potash himself added to the general din in a three-cornered discussion of the legal points involved Emile contended that Aaron could replevin the violin upon the ground of Abe's misrepresentation at the time of the purchase, and Abe denied it in Yiddish and English, with emphatic profanity in both languages. Into this melee, Morris hurled himself with a resounding Cush! Are y'all crazy or do what? he demanded. Well, Abe cried, where is it? Instantly there was a dead silence and all eyes rested on morris where's what morris asked the amati emil piltz cried and morris laughed out loud Kevek, he said you're an expert piltz shook his head in a bullying fashion never mind if i'm an expert or not he said where is that amati which i seen it myself at geigerman's house only last night it is at geigerman's house today morris replied right now it is there and it would stay there too young fella because that fiddle which you seen it is one of the geigerman paid three thousand dollars for you seen the wrong fiddle that's all this statement seemed to rouse aaron shellac to a hysterical frenzy liar and thief he screamed give me my fiddle one moment shellac morris said before you put on your hat and coat and go home which you shouldn't trouble yourself to come back at all i want to show you something he explored his waistcoat pocket ain't this the label which was in your fiddle he asked handing aaron a slip of paper aaron examined it carefully and nodded that other crazy indian over there morris continued pointing to the professor look at this label ain't it the same which was in the fiddle Ladislaw Chelak examined the printed slip, and he, too, nodded. Next, Morris turned to old man Hubai, who stood apart, muttering to himself. "'Someone ask that old greenhorn if it's the same label that was in the fiddle. I don't know what he's got to do with this business, but he may know anyhow.' Chelak interpreted Morris's words and showed the label to the old man, who replied volubly in Hungarian. He says he thinks it is, the professor said, but he doesn't know for sure. Well, I know it's the same, Morris retorted, because I took it out there myself this morning. Here, Morris cleared his throat and assumed an air of such dignity, not to say majesty, that to Abe 
It seemed as though he had never rightly known his partner until that moment. "'Now, look on the other side of the label,' Morris cried. Once more the label went the rounds, and after Emil Piltz had examined it, he put on his hat and made for the elevator. Almost on tiptoe, Professor Ladislaw Chelak followed him, while Aaron repaired to the cutting room and packed up his belongings, preparatory to forsaking a career as a cutter for one of music. At length, only old man who buy remained. "'What are you waiting for?' Morris demanded. "'Me, poor man,' Abai said. "'Me no got car fare. Me no got trinkgeld. Me no got nothing.' Morris handed him a quarter, and he shuffled off toward the back stairs. Meantime, Abe staggered to his feet and passed his hand over his forehead. "'Tell me, Morris,' he said, "'what's this all about?' "'It's just what I says just now, Abe.' Morris exploded. That expert seen the wrong fiddle. The fiddle you gave Gargaman is no more three hundred years old than I am. Why ain't it? Abe asked. For answer, Morris handed him the label. On the obverse side, Abe read the inscription. Nicholas Amati Cremonensis. Facibai Anno 1670. Now turn it over, Morris said and Abe described on the reverse side a familiar oval mark, bearing the following inscription. Allied Printers Trade Council, Union Label, New York City. End of section 9. Section 10 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris, Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter, by Montague Glass. Section 10. Chapter 7. Part 1. Brothers All. What's the use talking, Morris? Abe Potash protested. The fellow couldn't even talk ten words English at all. Sure, I know. Morris Perlmutter admitted. But he would quick learn. Quick learn! Abe exclaimed. What do you mean, quick learn? Nowadays I never seen the like. A greenhorn comes here from Rusland, which he's such an ignoramus he don't even know his own name, understand me, and he expects right away to get a job in a cloak and suit concern uptown, where they would learn him how he should talk English, and at the same time paying ten dollars a week? Actually, Morris, them fellas think they're doing you a favor if they ruin ten garments a day on you in exchange for learning em English. Me, when I come over from Rulicent, I was also so grossartic. I was glad to get a job learning on shirts, in a sub-cellar, and the boss borrowed me for wages. I got an elegant bill of fare, too, I bet you, Morris. Every day for dinner, salt and herring and potatoes, except Sundays, his onions extra. And did that fellow learn me English, Morris? Oh, sir, Stuck, I must go to night school to learn English, Morris. And I did, Morris, and they learnt me good there, Morris. And so this here fellow you're talking about, he should do the same. We wouldn't got to learn him English, Abe, Morris declared. The fellow's a bright, smart fellow, and he could pick it up quick enough. Sure, I know, Abe rejoined. And pick it up a whole lot of other things, too, Morris. Silks and velvets and buttons and fellas picks up. Not this fellow, Abe. Morris said. He's from a decent, respectable people in the old country. He's studying for a doctor already when he comes over here. But he gets into trouble on account he belongs to a politics society over there, so he's got to run away. The fellow's a bright fella, Abe. I know them bright fellas, Morris. Sit up till all hours of the night in Canal Street coffee houses, killing off Grand Dukes. Grand Dukes has got to make a living the same like anybody else, Morris. And anyhow, Morris, when a fella comes over here from Russell and Morris, he ain't got no business bothering his head about Grand Dukes. The way things is nowadays in the cloak and suit trade, Morris, a fella's got all he could attend to holding on to his job. Morris shrugged. Let's give the fella a show anyhow, Abe, he rejoined. And if he don't soon make good, we quick fire him, you understand? That's what you said about that fella, Harkavy which we give him a job in our cutting room, Morris. All the time he works for us, acts so dumb like a ten-year-old child. 
and soon as we fire him morris he goes to work by climbing in ellenbogen and turns out a couple of styles which the least them highwaymen makes out of him is five thousand dollars how should i know what harkavy could do with climbing in ellenbogen abe morris cried you're the prophet of this here concern abe always you're predicting to me tomorrow it's going to happen yesterday well what's forby is forby morris abe retorted and if i got to stand here all day and schmooze with you morris go ahead and hire the feller only one thing i'm saying to you morris don't tell me afterward that i was in favor of the feller from the start cause i ain't with this ultimatum abe glanced toward the cutting room where sat a tall stooping figure holding in his hands a peaked cap only to look at the feller gives me a crank morris abe continued so if you're going to hire him, Morris, do me the favor and give him a couple of dollars out of the safe so you should get a shave and a haircut and a new hat. Morris nodded and started for the cutting room when Abe called him back. For my part, Morris, I don't care what people says, you understand, he declared. But if we got a couple of them 34th Street buyers around here and they sees our work people has got such shoes which their toes sticking out already, Morris, what do they think of us? Am I right or wrong? Sure, I know morris said but but nothing morris abe concluded for three dollars we should make suckers out of ourselves don't stand there like a fool morris give the fellow five dollars he should buy himself a pair of shoes and ferdy the transformation begun in caesar kovalenko by a haircut and the shave was made complete when morris accompanied by kovalenko's cousin went with him to a retail clothing establishment there Caesar discarded forever his cap, top boots, and frogged overcoat, and emerged, but for his vocabulary, a naturalized citizen of the cloak and suit trade. Now all he's got to do, Morris said, is to work hard, and we would quick be making good wages. Sure, sure, the cousin replied. At first, maybe he'd be a little dumb on account he got a whole lot of experiences lately. Experiences? Morris asked. What for experiences? Well, in the first place, the cousin proceeded, two years ago he's studying for a doctor in the University of Harkov, and next door to him, one house by the other, lives a fellow which ain't got nothing to say against him, you understand? Only he goes to work and sends a package to the chief of police, Mr. Perlmutter. When they open the package, you understand, inside is something fixed mind you mr perlmutter i wouldn't say nothing if it would be really the chief of police which would open the package but always it's some poor schnorrer which the chief of police calls in from the street this time it was a fellow by the name of levin a decent respectable young fellow his father was a rob the old man is coming over this week you understand mr perlmutter but when the chief of police sends out levin in the back yard he should open the package understand me that's the last anyone sees either from the package or either from levin morris clicked his tongue sympathetically and what they done to this fellow which sends the package he asked him they didn't do nothing mr perlmutter the cousin replied but caesar here they put it all on him first they're making him arrested and then the police pretty near kill him and the cossacks take him from harkov to odessa he should get tried and then they pretty near kill him there and if it wouldn't be that we're sending over to give a judge there a couple of thousand rubles they would right away shoot him Anyhow, Mr. Perlmutter, one year my cousin sits in prison there, and then we're sending over a couple of thousand rubles more, which give him a fella what runs the prison, and so my cousin sneaks out of there, and he comes over here to this country. Morris gazed at the neatly clad figure, who walked quietly along beside him. You wouldn't think it to look at him, he said, but anyhow, I do my best to see he gets a good show, and he would quick learn, I bet you. By this time they had reached Potash and Perlmutter's premises, and the cousin shook hands warmly with Morris. "'You got a good heart, Mr. Perlmutter,' he declared fervently. "'And you wouldn't lose money, supposing you did pay him eight dollars a week to start.' Morris paused before passing indoors. "'Listen here to me,' he said. "'Maybe I got a good heart, maybe I ain't.' But your cousin starts on five dollars a week, understand me? And if he gets six dollars inside of a month, he would got to earn it. Despite this assertion, however, it was barely three weeks before Caesar Kovalenko was earning and receiving eight dollars a week 
for never in their business experience had abe and morris employed a more intelligent workman not only did he exhibit great promise as an assistant cutter but he had acquired a knowledge of english sufficient for his needs if the fellow keeps on abe morris said we would soon got to give him another raise he's a wonder abe nodded gloomily you can get all the wonders you want morris to learn cutting at eight dollars a week he said and supposing he does pick up english quick morris a fellow could be a regular henry shakespeare you understand and he would be any better a garment cutter on that account am i right or wrong well certainly it don't do no harm that kovalenko understands a little english morris commented sure not abe agreed satirically because the quicker he learns english morris the quicker he would copy our styles and find a job with a competitor take this here harkavy for instance only this morning i seen felix geigerman in the subway and he says that Kleiman and ella bogan is showing at a dollar less on the garment a ringer for our style 4022 which we sold him morris now who tells him suckers how they could cut down on the buttons and the lining morris and put one pleat less on the skirt morris i suppose you did or i did morris ain't it he paused for a reply but none came and yet morris he concluded that fellow harkavy was a wonder too and i suppose morris that the way he picked up english would be a big consolation to us morris if a good customer like geigerman leaves us and goes over to climbing in ellenbogen morris grunted scornfully you're all the time looking for trouble abe he said if we would lose as many customers as you're talking about abe we wouldn't got a decent concern left on our books at all you got to give geigerman credit for knowing a good garment when he sees it sure i know morris abe replied geigerman knows a good garment when he sees it but his customers don't if geigerman could get it for a dollar less than ours garments would look like ours and is like ours all but the buttons and the pleats and the skirt we could kiss ourselves good-bye with business no matter how many bright greenhorns we got it in our cutting room Gavag, morris exclaimed you don't know what you're talking about abe nevertheless when felix geigerman the well-known harlem dry goods merchant and violin dilettante entered potash and perlmutter's showroom the next morning morris greeted him with some misgiving hello felix he said you giving us a repeat order so soon already on them four o two twos felix shook his head i got a few words to say to abe morris he replied is he in now morris smiled amiably although he was convinced that felix's visit voted a cancellation of the four o two twos he ain't in now he answered but if you wait a few minutes he'll be right back he returned hastily to the office for he knew that if abe found them in conversation on his return he would impute the cancellation of the order to something morris had said thus felix was left alone in the showroom save for caesar kovalenko who plied a feather duster industrially among the sample racks as he worked caesar whistled russian melody half sad half cheerful and felix paused midway in the lighting of his cigar it was the opening theme in the second movement of tchaikovsky's fourth symphony and caesar's rendition of it was not only true to pitch but he managed to introduce certain nuances that to felix proclaimed the born musician what's that you whistling he inquired and caesar smiled tchaikovsky's fourth symphony he replied and then he reached around to his hip pocket see i got music he handed a paper-covered miniature score to geigerman who opened it at random ha felix exclaimed as his eye lit on a familiar phrase in the last movement he hummed it over and caesar joined him in a clear musical baritone they were thus engaged when a tall broad-shouldered individual entered the showroom sorry to interrupt you gentlemen he said but is the boss in in the back office there felix replied will you tell him mr gunther would like to see him the newcomer continued i will if you want me to felix said 
but i'm here only a customer excuse me mr gunther apologized i was talking about the other fellow however he proceeded to the office and engaged morris in earnest conversation for several minutes they returned to the showroom just as caesar was replacing the score in his hip pocket the motion was too much for mr gunther whose occupation made him nervous and he plunged his hand into his overcoat and brought out a shining metallic object there was a sharp struggle and caesar kovalenko leaned against the partition with his wrists encircled by a pair of handcuffs come along quiet said mr gunter calmly or i'll knock your block off at this juncture the elevator door banged open and abe came into the showroom what's the matter here he cried mr gunter smiled i am a united states deputy marshal he proclaimed and i'm arresting this guy under a warrant duly issued in the southern district of new york i got a taxicab downstairs and if any of you gentlemen is a friend of the prisoner you can come along to the marshal's office morris darted into the office and reappeared with his hat and coat abe he said you stay here in the store i'll go down with him abe frowned one moment morris he cried I didn't go so quick as all that. First, we would find out what he makes this young fellow arrested for. The deputy marshal nodded. That's all right. You're entitled to know it. He's arrested on the complaint of the Russian consulate for something he did in Russia two years ago. In Russia? Abe exclaimed. Two years ago. Morris, do me a favor. You stay in the store, and I go with him. Felix Geigerman placed his hand on Abe's arm. Say, looky here, Abe he said i'll tell you the truth i'm pretty busy today here to cancel them four or two twos but now i don't care at all you could ship them goods if you want to abe but one thing i ask you as a favor let me go with him i don't care what the other fellow says i'm just now talking to this here young fellow and if he done anything in russia understand me i would eat it so you stay here attend to business and i'll go with him morris drew on his overcoat with force sufficient to rip the sleeve lining nathan the shipping clerk could tend to the store abe he declared and we'll all go with him in the first place morris abe said after they had returned from the united states commissioner's office where caesar kovalenko had been arraigned and committed without bail to the tombs in the first place what are we bothering our heads about this young fella of course when i was down there morris and see the fellow from the russian council's office which he's got a face morris hard like iron you understand i didn't say nothing but the way you're going to work a telephone to henry d feldman and everything morris before we get through with him it would cost us anyhow a couple of hundred dollars geigerman said he go half morris said sure i know morris but just because geigerman acts like a sucker morris why should we get ourselves into it too furthermore morris how do we know geigerman would go half he's that kind of a fellow morris when he says something he don't take it so particular he should stick to it morris one day he gives us an order and the next day he cancels it morris and that's the kind of man he is he didn't cancel it abe morris cried he was going to cancel but he changed his mind sure he changed his mind abe interrupted and what's going to hinder him changing his mind on the other proposition morris he could take it from me morris when the time comes he should pay up understand me it'll be a case of next visit and don't you forget it morris shrugged impatiently no hey what could we do once in a while we couldn't help ourselves you understand should we let this poor greenhorn be sent back to rusland and he ain't got a relative in the world understand me except his cousin which he's just as poor as kovalenko that's all right morris abe declared i ain't kicking we should help the fellow all i'm saying is there's lots of our people which we got more dollars as we got dimes take moses m Stoyman, for instance that's a fellow which he's got a big charity fellow understand why shouldn't he help kovalenko well in the first place no one tells him about it abe morris said and in the second place but why don't we tell him about it morris abe interrupted why don't you go now to see him morris and tell him all about it me go down to see him abe morris cried why the fellow's a multi-millionaire with such people like that i couldn't open my mouth at all why don't you go down to see him why should i go down abe asked you're the lodge brother here morris ain't it 
You're the one which you're always sitting up there till all hours of the night making motions. I couldn't make a motion to save my life, Morris. You know it. Sure, I know. Morris protested, but lodge meetings is something else again. You know, a fellow could talk at a lodge meeting, and what is it? A couple of young lawyers, which they couldn't even pay their laundry bills, you understand? And a dozen other fellows, insurance brokers, or the cigar dealers, and most of them old-timers at that. Why should I be afraid to say a little something to them? But with a fellow like Moses M. Steuermann, which his folks is bankers in Frankfurt on the Main, when Carnegie and Vanderbilt, with all them with the Goyim, was a new beginner's yet, Abe, that's a different proposition entirely. Abe nodded and remained silent for a few minutes. Might Felix Geigerman would go down and see him, Morris, he suggested finally. Wouldn't do no harm, we should ring him up anyhow. Go as far as you like, Abe, Morris said, and Abe started immediately for the telephone. I spoke to Felix, Morris he announced a few minutes later, and Felix said he'd go right down and see him. He ain't so stuck up on paying Feldman a couple hundred dollars neither. Morris snorted indignantly. If he's going to be charitable, Abe, he said, why don't you be a sport? You could easy stand a couple hundred dollars. That's all right, Morris, Abe declared. Business is business, and charity is charity, you understand? But even in charity, Morris, it don't do no harm to keep the expenses down. Two hours afterward, Felix Geigerman entered the showroom, his face glistening with perspiration. "'Well, boys,' he almost shouted, "'I seen him, and he says he will call in here on his way uptown.' "'Who would call in?' Morris asked. "'Moses M. Steuermann,' Felix replied. "'It was a Tchaikovsky fourth that fixed him, Morris. "'I told him the young fella carries round with him an orchestral score, "'and right away he says he'd come up. "'For years I see Mr. Stoyum at the Philharmonics "'in the Boston Symphonies, Morris. "'I didn't know who he was at all. "'I always thought he was something to do with music publishing concern.' "'Stoyum got something to do with the music publishing concern?' "'Morris exclaimed. "'I'm surprised to hear you. "'You should talk that way, Felix.' Well, when you see in year in and year out a fellow goes to every concert, what is? Felix explained. Naturally, you get an idea his in the music business, ain't it? That's what you think, Felix, Abe said, taking up the cudgels in defense of Steuermann. But you could take it from me, Felix, if a fellow like Steuermann seemingly fools away his time at concerts, understand me, he ain't doing it for nothing. He probably gets some business out of it. Seem like a lot of fellows you would think is making suckers of themselves going to lodge meetings, Felix. Most of them sells many a big bill of goods that way. That ain't here nor there, Abe, Felix rejoined. The point is, Stroyman would be up here at five o'clock. So, what are you going to tell him when he calls? Me tell him, Abe cried. Why, I wouldn't be here at all. I gotta go. Now, see, and now, customer, Prince Clarence. You ain't got to do nothing of the kind, Abe, Morris retorted angrily. You're going to stay right here and talk to that fellow when he comes. What do you think? I'm going to be the goat every time. What's the matter, Abe? Felix asked. Are you afraid of the fellow? He couldn't eat you up, Abe. What do you mean, afraid of him? Abe exclaimed. I'm seen by big merchants every day, Felix. I could talk right up to them, too, but this year my partner's affair. He gave Kovalenko in the first place, and... "'What's the use talking, Abe?' Morris interrupted. "'If you go home, I go home. "'So you gotta stay, and we would both see the fellow. "'What's the difference, supposing the fellow does got a couple of million dollars?' "'A couple of million dollars?' Felix said. "'Why, I bet you if the fellow's got a cent, he's worth twenty million dollars.' "'Abe drew pale. "'Say, looky here. "'Why should I talk to Mr. Steuermann?' he besought. You could do this without me, Morris. Don't be a baby, Abe, Morris retorted. Felix, stay here with us, and not me, boys, Felix said. I guess you got to excuse me. I done enough already, and if you don't get home right away, change my underclothes, which they're dripping wet with perspiration, I could sure catch a bad cold. He shook Abe and Morris warmly by the hand, and hardly had the elevator door closed behind him when the showroom became a scene of nervous activity. Nathan, Abe yelled to the shipping clerk, fetch the broom. The place looks like a pigsty here. He turned to Morris with excited 
gesture. Do me the favor, Mars, he said. Tell a couple of them young fellows from the cutting room to come in here. Them sample racks ain't been straightened up for a week. I'm going around to the barber shop, Mars. I'll be right back. End of chapter 7, part 1. End of section 10.